Now, Sadio Mane admits he didn't have to think twice when presented with the opportunity to leave Liverpool for Bayern Munich. After completing his £35 million move, he revealed that Jurgen Klopp wanted him to stay at Anfield but couldn't persuade him because he wanted a new challenge after six years at the club. He didn't even uh, think twice. I just accepted. And uh, for me, like I said, it's, uh, I had offers. My agent, but uh, I choose Bayern because I think it's the right club. And I was really, really, and I'm still really happy to be part of this uh, big club. I think uh, I spent, uh, of course, six wonderful years in Liverpool and uh, with uh, very, very, very nice people and uh, great friends. And of course, like I said, uh, of course, there was no happy. And uh, but uh, it's uh, it's a part of life. In myself, I I need uh, and spend uh, in Premier League in general last six eight years, and I need new challenge. And like I said, now Bayern was uh, for me uh, the right club. Yeah, club is club. You know him, very good guy, and of course he would love me to stay. But uh, of course, I think uh, like I said, very very. Great guy, he understands my situation like uh, the club and they accept and yeah, I wish of course all the best. Well, Mohamed Salah tweeted to wish his former forward partner the very best by saying, it's been quite a ride. Thank you for all the good times and I wish you the best in your new adventure. You will be missed by all of us. Well, following confirmation of the deal, Jurgen Klopp has also paid tribute to Mane, describing him as a legend, but also a modern-day Liverpool icon. Well, Klopp said, it's a big moment. There's no point in anyone trying to pretend otherwise. One of Liverpool's greatest ever players is leaving, and we must acknowledge how significant this is. He leaves with our gratitude and our love. The goals he scored, the trophies he won, a legend for sure but also a modern-day Liverpool icon. I respect completely his decision, and I'm sure our supporters do also. If you love LFC, you have to love Sadio, non-negotiable. It is possible to do this while accepting our loss is Bayern's gain. We wish him nothing but success in every match he plays in, unless, of course, it's against us. His start will continue to rise, I have no doubts. Well, our senior reporter, Melissa Reddy, has joined me on set. Melissa, nice to see you this evening. All right, what, what's his legacy then at Liverpool? I think he will be remembered as the first transformer of the Jurgen Klopp era, the spark that started it all, that spelt the change in Liverpool's playing style, uh, their desire to be back amongst the elite, to be a domestic powerhouse and a European powerhouse. He joined and got them back into Champions League football, scored incredibly vital goals on their route to winning um, the trophy in 2019, the first piece of silverware of the club era, and then went on and won everything he possibly could win um, at the club. So this fresh challenge m makes a lot of sense. I think when describing him, though, it's not just about the goals he scored and, and the creative output. He worked tirelessly off the pitch. He was incredibly low maintenance, very humble, was always willing to be in the shadows or, or take a back seat and allow somebody else to shine. Remember, when he joined Liverpool, he played as the right attacker. When Mohamed Salah joined, because that was his favourite position, he switched to the left and was remarkable there and then ended up exiting Liverpool as their false nine, their focal point and he was great there as well. So Jurgen Klopp's called him a legend, a modern day icon, so what does this transfer say about Liverpool? I think the fact that he leaves in the height of his career still, you know, he's a Ballon d'Or candidate, he's done exceptionally well on the international stage as well. He's going to a powerhouse in Bayern Munich. And yet, for all he contributed to Liverpool and the affection that obviously the, the coaching staff, the players, the supporters have for him, this doesn't feel like the end of days. It doesn't feel detrimental. And that's a credit to Liverpool's quiet evolution 
off their forward line. They don't want the players to age altogether, so they've brought in Jota gradually, then Diaz and now Darwin Nunes. And, you know, the front three have been really helpful in the fact that they've set the standards, they've allowed these players to come in and, and settle immediately because of what they've managed to do. These players are not under pressure because of the front three still being there. And um, I just think Liverpool's recruitment staff have earned so much credit because of the way they've handled the incomings. And so such a significant outgoing, Jurgen Klopp's own words, doesn't really feel that way. There's another argument, though, isn't there? Liverpool played in three cup finals last season, didn't score a goal. They've got this much vaunted front three or front five, whatever you want to call them. They scored fewer goals than the champions who played without a recognised striker. So did Liverpool actually have to make these changes and freshen things up? I don't think the changes are necessitated by the three finals and not scoring a goal. They contributed, I think, 58 shots in those three finals and all the analytics will tell you it was probably more likely to score 15 goals from that 58 from those specific 58 shots than it was to score zero so liverpool and we credit their recruitment stuff they're not making massive decisions based on three games the evolution is natural because you have to stay a step ahead. You have to keep transitioning. You cannot have an old forward line, especially with the demands Klopp places on them in a physical aspect. And as great as that front three have been, you cannot be sentimental about it. The game's changing, you have to evolve, and Liverpool have gradually done that. And ultimately, you'll see the fading away of Roberto Firmino. We know Mohamed Salah has a year left of his contract, he said he's staying the summer, but perhaps next season he wants to leave on a free. And so Liverpool have to consider this. They've got remarkable service from those three, and they have allowed, as I said, the new uh, attackers to come in and have this incredible structure and template to work off. But ultimately, Liverpool need to keep it moving. And I think these decisions, allowing him to leave with gratitude and best wishes and, and rejigging that attack is just imperative to them staying in competition with, like you say, City, who did so well without a recognised striker and now went and got the, the player we all expect to be the future Ballon d'Or dominant force in that. Sure. Let's broaden this a little bit. Say Mo Salah, you say, a year on his contract. Can you envisage a time when Liverpool sell him to Manchester United or to Manchester City? So what I'm saying is, do the top Premier League clubs have to sell to each other more? I think that definitely has to happen in terms of Premier League clubs doing more deals with each other, especially rivals for players of of esteem and one of the examples we'll use is Raheem Sterling, Chelsea being very interested in him and Manchester City having to think to themselves, well, we need to allow perhaps that departure because the fees these players are on and, and the transfer figures they would command, the rest of Europe cannot compete with, with Premier League sides at present. So those deals, are, I think, are going to become commonplace. The Salah situation in particular his camp keep leaking that his preference is to stay in the Premier League and, and that's what it's like. Now, on Liverpool's end, they see that very much as, as a negotiating tactic because if we're being honest, where could he possibly go that, that meets his ambitions and stuff in the league city? While I think clubs have to become better at selling to each other, I don't think those two who see themselves a little bit separately from the rest, they know they are each other's real competitors, they are the benchmark setters, I don't think deals between these two happen. But in general, with Leeds and Arsenal, as we're seeing with the Rafinha interest, but specifically with that Sterling deal, I think will trigger a state of play where Premier League clubs just understand they're going to get better at negotiating with each other. So are you saying then that Manchester City don't see Chelsea as that much of a rival at the moment that they can sell one of their best players to them? I think they know if they would allow Sterling to exit to Chelsea and, and we have to state actually that 
there's been no formal approach from Chelsea yet and no concrete talks with the player or anything like that. But hypothetically, if they let St Sterling go to Chelsea, that strengthens Chelsea, right? It, it closes the gap a little bit. But still, in saying that, if Chelsea are the only club seriously coming in for him because, like we say, the other European clubs can't afford the salary, transfer fee, can't really compete with their Premier League counterparts, then, you know, City have to weigh up. Do we keep him and let him go for free next summer? Like, what is the winning scenario? And so, ultimately, the, the teams have to become used to, comfortable with, and more acute at negotiations with their rivals intra-transfer. Melissa Reddy, senior reporter, thank you very much.